Okay, so today uh, I want to discuss uh, in some detail what a monoidal category is, what an action of a monoidal category is, and give some examples. And I guess in preparing this lecture, I expected that you've probably seen the definition of a monoidal category before. I want to go over it briefly, but I just want to emphasize a repeated theme when doing higher higher algebra, so things like monoidal categories or um, or two categories or things like this, in that there's a wealth of coherence data that you need to take along. And I think that historically we've taken a kind of generators, generators and relations approach to this data, whereas nowadays uh, people are starting to take a more holistic point of view. And I just want to emphasize this uh, distinction in a few examples. Uh, so, monoidal categories and their actions. And just to connect this back to the, to the course, I tried to emphasize last week that the basic philosophy in establishing the archipop bezor kavnikov theorem is to realize certain constructible categories as modules over certain monoidal categories. And these monoidal categories get more and more complicated as you get closer and closer to proving the equivalence. So in, um, so in rep theory, so in kind of classical rep theory, we study the action of something like an algebra. on M, a vector space. And uh, we have a rich theory, so we have irreducible, so we have simple objects, semi-simplicity, etc. And what we're trying to do is to um, understand to what extent these kind of powerful techniques can be extended to actions of monoidal categories. So in two rep theory, we are interested in A, a monoidal category. Acting on M, a category. And as I said last time, the analog of having A act on a general category would be the analog of having some object in the classical world acting on a set. And we can't really say much about actions on sets, but if we have some additional linear structure, we can use linear algebra, etc. And so here we want our category to be, um, let's say, additive, triangulated. Abelian, etc. Uh, and I just want to emphasize uh, the following will be a theme. Is that there's kind of two approaches to higher algebra. And it, but more precisely, there's two approaches to the coherence data of higher algebra. The first approach is carry, I would summarize it as saying carry just enough coherence. And then the second approach is to basically, so this is um, what I want to call generators and relations. The second approach is to carry um, all coherence. 
and this I want to call holistic. I was trying to trying to find a word that wasn't so manifestly positive. If I had to put myself in one in the two camps, I'm probably much more of a generators and relations type person, but I'm trying to force myself to be more of a holistic type person, I would say. Uh, so if this makes no sense at all, here's an example. This is a very uh, simple example. So if X is a, a reasonable topological space, there's two ways of computing the homology of X. So we can compute the homology of X via, we can take a triangulation And this gives us um, simplicial homology. So this would be the kind of generators and relations approach where we just take enough simplices to describe our space. And the holistic approach would be to take, to compute the homology of X via, um, take all all um, singular n simplices and then take um, singular homology okay and historically so if you know what a simplicial set is these two um, examples are kind of uh, consequences of two very different approaches to simplicial sets, namely as very combinatorial explicit objects or as highly infinite tools in homotopy theory. So these are the two, these are two approaches, these are two different approaches to homotopy theory. And just a remark uh, before we go on, if you look historically, the first definitions of homology, um, cohomology, etc., were via simplicial homology. And then we had this passage. I remember when I first saw the definition of singular homology, I thought it was awful. How on earth can you possibly have any control over all maps into all maps from a simplex into a space? It's some enormous thing. But it has it's much easier to show that it has nice functorial properties. So a remark is that historically, um, let's call this A and B, A comes first and B is more powerful. And I would say that with the uh, kind of Lurie Lure generation of um, in higher algebra and higher category theory, we're seeing basically, I would say that we've spent uh, 30 or 40 years talking about higher categories in the generators relations language. And now there's another, a new generation that is taking the holistic approach. Um, and this will probably end up winning. So we might end up having to read hundreds of pages of Lurie after all. Okay. So you can see this uh, bias towards generators relations in that the very definition of a monoidal category is via generators relations. So I want to explain that briefly. Are there any questions based on this? before I move slides.
Okay. So, uh, you've probably all seen the definition before, but I just want to go over it again. What is a one order category? So we have, uh, so it's a category A, a bifunctor, a unit object, an associator, And unit, so these are these are natural transformations of trifunctors. And then we have the left unit. And the right unit. such that two diagrams commute. So this is a, a category. And the two diagrams are the, um, the pentagon. So if we start with X tensor Y, tensor Z, So W, there are two ways from here that we can apply our associativity constraint. We can go X tensor Y tensor Z. And here we can go to X tensor Y tensor Z tensor W. So here, for example, we're using the, the associativity constraint applied to X tensor Y. Said W. And now, so, whoops, to Z. And now we can go to X tensor, Y tensor, Z tensor, W. And here we can go to X tensor, Y tensor, Z tensor, W. So this should commute, this commutes. And then we have, uh, there's two ways to go from X tensor one, tensor Y. We can use our associativity to go across to X tensor one, tensor Y. And then here we can apply our so there's a common convention that I'll probably use um, every now and again, which is instead of writing the identity map on an object, you just write the object itself. So normally I would, if we we're being totally formal here, I would write um, um, row X tensor the identity of Y. So this is a map to X tensor Y. But it's quite common to just write this as row X tensor Y. So this commutes. Okay. Um, and we also have the notion of a monodal functor that I won't recall. Okay, so this is this is a functor between two tensor categories together with a natural isomorphism between f of x tensor y and f of 
x tends to f of y, satisfying a diagram, and also it should take the unit to the unit. And why is this a generators and relations definition? So there's this basic claim, which is known as the McLean basic claim. is that any, if you have some big long tensor product, um, A tensor B tensor C tensor D tensor E tensor F tensor, with brackets in some places, and then you re-bracket and insert units and remove units except in any, any way, you can get from one big tensor product to another big tensor product in many, many ways. And the basic claim is that any of these ways will be the same. You'll get a quality of morphisms in your category. Okay. So um, any two maps built out of associates Plus their inverses. Agree. So, what this is really saying is that a monodal category is not. So, if I have some object like A tensor B tensor C, then there's two two ways that I can think about A tensor B tensor C. I can think about it as A tensor B tensor C, or I can think of it as A tensor B tensor C. And the associator gives me a canonical isomorphism between them. But what the McLean coherence theorem kind of tells us is that what is actually going on is there is really an object called A tensor B tensor C, where there's no particular order chosen. Um, and I think that that's probably a better way to think about this. Uh, so there's, so I just want to give you a rough idea of the better definition, but it's, it's better, but it's also much more complicated. So there's a holistic definition. Um, so if you're interested in this, it's in, um, it's really nicely written down in DAG 2, section 1 by Murray. Uh, and what is the rough idea? Is that we consider a tensor N, which is the um, category of sequences of N objects of A. Now, what we want to formalize is, what I said before is that we want kind of a, a way to tensor any number of objects. So we want to kind of functor that takes in any number of objects and spits out their tensor product. But now we want a whole host of compatibilities. And in order to formalize that whole host of compatibilities, we need to be able to take any number of objects and tensor any subset of them. Okay. So, uh, so a monoidal category to a whole host of functors so if i imagine an object inside a tensor 5 this would be something like x1 x2 x3 x4, x5, and now there's a functor to A tensor 3, which is 
x1 tends to x2, identity x4, x3 tends to x4, tends to x5. Okay, so there is such an operation. And so we should think about a monodal category as being a category together with a whole host of such operations plus a whole host of compatibilities. And then probably one should define a monodal category in this way and then say theorem, it is equivalent to the previous definition. The previous definition is kind of putting the cart before the horse. So now we have a, the notion of, a, of an A module for a, a monodal category. So a left left module for a monodal category, a left module M um, consists of So we have um, the kind of generators and relations definition, which just says that we have a bifunctor tensor product from A to A times M to M, um, an associator and a left unit such that, um, and now we just have the same, essentially the same diagrams. So this such that the same diagrams, except we such that the same diagrams. Actually. Uh, now I can't remember what the, f yeah, exactly. So the plus the unit diagram just has exactly the same form. Uh, and, and we have holistic and given the rough version of the previous holistic definition, I'm sure you can guess the rough version of this one. And if you want to see the details, they're in DAG two. Section two. Um, and a proposition, which to be honest, I haven't checked, is that uh, A modules are the same thing. So in algebra, we know that modules are the same thing as representations. And this proposition is the analog of that. So an A module is the same thing as a pair M phi, where M is a category and phi is a tensor functor from A to end of M. So exercise.
that Jody didn't do. Check this. Okay. Uh, ought. Ah, no. End. Because this is really the analog of being a module over an algebra rather than um, a module over a group. And this um, should be an equivalence of two categories. Okay, so the category of there's a two category of categories. There's also a two category of A modules, and there's a two category of representations of A. And these two two categories should be equivalent. Uh, so I want to uh, now give you some examples. And these are examples uh, um, somehow intended to have a dual effect. So they're intended to uh, make you interested in this, but also to make you a tiny little bit scared of it. <laughs> but I don't want you to be too scared. Uh, so there needs to be a balance. Um, examples of modules over monodal categories. Maybe cautious. I would like you to be cautious. Will it become ought if we have a rigid monodal category? Still not. No. Um, yeah, I mean, for example, our, our monodal categories will typically have a zero object, and that zero object should give, go to the um, zero functor. Okay, so we're, we're doing group representations. And so it's natural to think, so if you look at the evolution of representation theory, we first studied representations of groups and then we realized that the study of representations of algebras is very useful. Um, and then probably most of our lives we start, we study now representations of algebras. However, um, it's kind of useful to think what would be the starting point for modules over monodal categories. And you might guess that it's monodal categories associated to groups. And I suspect that that guess is actually not quite right, but it's still very interesting to study this case. So we take G, a discrete group. So maybe just a little bit of uh, philosophy is, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody can make any sense of this, but I, I wonder if when we, we started studying groups and we started considering their actions on sets, and there it's enough to know how two elements compose. And I kind of wonder if that just permeated our our consciousness to such an extent that then when we went to monodal categories, we thought, okay, we just need to be able to take the product of two elements. I think it's an interesting philosophical question. And if anybody has any opinions, I would love to hear them. So if G is a discrete group, we can associate uh, a monodal category, which is a very simple monodal category to it. So it's, um, AG. And for the kind of stacky people in the audience, you can think about this as being loops on BG. Uh, so that remark can be ignored. And the objects are RG for G and G. And they just multiply according to the group. So 
RG tensor to RH is RGH and the associator and unit, left and right unit are all the identity. So this is what people call a strict monodal category where all of this issue of the higher coherences is uh, unnecessary. So what is a module over AG? All morphisms of the identity. So end RG is just a single identity of RG. Okay, so you can imagine this is just as a category, it's just a whole lot of points with no interaction. Sorry, I totally forgot the line that says that there's no interaction. So HOM RG RH is um, the empty set if G is not equal to H and the endomorphisms of if each unit guy has just its identity endomorphism. A very simple, simple object. Um, and what is a module over AG? So we use that it's the same thing as a tensor functor. So it's the same thing as a tensor functor from AG to end of M. And we define F of G to be the image under this function of R of G. So this is a, now this is really an auto, auto equivalence of our category because all of these elements are invertible. And then the data of being a tensor functor gives us maps, uh, what did I call them, mu G H. So these are isomorphisms between the image of R of G composed with the image of R of H to the image of R G H. And we also have part of the data of a tensor functor is an isomorphism between the identity functor and the equivalence associated to the identity transformation. And the, if you unpack what it means to be a tensor functor, which I haven't told you, we get FG, FH, FK. Note that endo functors of a category are a strict monodal category in the sense that um, if I compose three functors and I bracket them in different ways, I get the same functor. It's useful exercise to think about why this is the same functor for endo functors of a category, but it's not when we take tensor product of vector spaces or something like that. So I don't have to write any brackets here. And now I can expand this in two ways. So I can go first to FGH, FK. So in my notation from earlier, I would write this mu GH That morphism would be mu g h times the identity of f k. F g f h k. H k. So this should commute for all g h and k. And also um, left and right, there's diagrams for left and right units. So if I take f identity f x, then I can multiply to f x. <coughs> This would be mu identity x, but I can also use my unit. And here I take the identity map and similarly on the right. Okay. And this is what is, so this is what's known. This is known as a strict action of G on N. Okay. 
There's a very beautiful paper of Deline called Actions of Braid Groups on Categories. And he says, there's two notions we could consider. The first notion is that for every element of a group, we're assigned a, an equivalence and that these equivalences satisfy a, so, um, that FG times FH is isomorphic to FGH without a specified isomorphism. This is a weak action. And then there's this great sentence where he says, this notion is without interest. And then he says, what we actually care about is, uh, is strict actions. Okay. So we don't have an isomorphism of class of functors for every, uh, every element of the group. We really have a functor. And these functors compose in a coherent way. So let's see uh, what So maybe an example to um, just an exercise. is show so the uh, that a strict action of z on m is the same thing show that giving a It's the same thing as giving an equivalence then one has the same question okay but didn't i answer the question of masood so I think actually the question can be asked. So there's a little bit of confusion about terminology. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is also what Lin Yuan is confused about, but like one could have, there's a notion of monoidal factor, as you said, and then there's a notion of strict monoidal functor. And that's mm -hmm. the one where everything is identity, I think. So, um, so one could have thought that if when we, say, when we say strict action, we mean that all the things are identity, but that's not actually what you mean, right? Strict action means the correct object. Um, yes. Namely, you just give a morphism. Um, you see, because a strict monoidal category, as you said, is one where everything is identity. All yes. the associated. So there's a bit of just terminology confusion here. Um, but Anyway, I don't think it's very serious. So I, I should say, yeah, it's very important here that this is not a strict tensor functor. Right. So a strict action is not a strict tensor functor. That's yeah. So it's a it's a tensor functor from this category that happens to be strict to endo functors of your category. Yeah, maybe another comment which may be helpful is that any monoidal category you can make it. Well, at least this was my impression. You can make it strict. Um, That's a fact. But not every monoidal functor. So, um, in any case, what you want, I guess, is just a monoidal functor in the yes. classical so this is just, sense of the word. Yeah, just a, a non-strict monoidal functor, yeah. Because if this was strict, we would really be asking that FGH is equal to FG, FG, FH. Okay, and that's too strong in general. Then one, does that answer your question? I 
I assume you can still hear hear. I'll think about it later. Okay. Uh, so, giving a strict action or of the integers on a category is just the same thing as giving an equivalence of m. Okay. So this is what you would think that give, kind of giving an action of z on a vector space is just the same thing as giving an auto automorphism. Um, and this exercise really needs a little bit of thought. So if you haven't thought about these things before, um, needs thought. It's not obvious. Okay. And to convince you that it needs a little bit of thought, I just want to give another example. Uh, so what does it mean to give an action of Z mod 2Z on a category? So uh, I want to make the guess, so I'll probably finish this example because it's really beautiful and then we'll have a break. So I'll probably go a little bit over the, we might have our T at 10 rather than 9.55. Uh, so what would be the first guess, the guess that I guess everybody would make, would be that it's M together with E and auto equivalence an equivalence plus something tell, telling me that this equivalence squares to be the identity. Okay. Now, um, the claim is that this is wrong. And I just want to uh, explain an action satisfying um, this condition. So I want to describe a bit of data satisfying this condition, which does not lift to an action of Z mod 2Z. And what's the key point? So the diagram, if we look at the triple tensor product of E with itself, so E composed with itself three times, so we have two maps. So we have EM, which goes to E, and ME that goes to E. And we have the identity here. And this should commute. So I want to give you an example of, of, of data, of this data, for which um, this doesn't commute. Okay, so the example is simple. So we take a category. X, Y, Om, x, y equals hom, y, x equals zero. And the endomorphisms of x and y are k a field. Okay, so here's a picture of our category. We have x and y, and then we have endomorphisms k, endomorphisms k. And E is going to be the obvious thing, which is to swap X and Y. So E of X equals Y, E of Y equals X. So this is my auto equivalence from M to itself. Okay, so, and note that E is an auto equivalence, so it should take the identity to the 
identity. So it should take the identity on um, X to the identity on Y. And so it, that actually fixes what it does to all, all of the, so we think about this E is acting on this whole collection of objects and arrows, but the, the claim is that it just sends X to Y and does, doesn't act on the arrows in any interesting way. And now I want to give you the M. So M should be a map from E squared to the identity functor. But note that E squared is the identity functor. Yeah. So E sends X to X and y to y, e is not isomorphic to the identity functor, it is the identity functor. Hence, m can be seen as a map from the identity functor to the identity functor, i.e. m is an element of the center of the category. Okay. So set M to be um, multiplication by A on end of X and multiplication by B on end of Y. Now, if you think about this diagram, so Let's see. Um, let's compute this diagram for action on X. So firstly, we so if we consider E, E of X to X, so this map is, um, so this is X, and this map is A. So this map is A. And now when we apply E to it, we get the map Y, to y which is a but up here um, when we apply e to the identity of y we just get one so here we get b y so this commutes if and only if a equals b. Okay. So there's plenty of choices here um, for a and b in order not to get an action of z mod 2z. Okay. And exercise which is also a little bit tricky. This is an exercise that I first read in Kashiwara Shapira when I was a grad student and it really baffled me. Um, show that Z mod 2Z acting on M is the same thing as M E and little m plus the fact that that diagram up here commutes. Okay. So um, let's have a eight minute break and then I'll try to explain in rough terms where the hell these strange conditions are coming from topologically and then we'll discuss the case of representations of representations of SL2.
So what's the categorical analog? Mm, I could be wrong, but I think that there isn't. It's so we'll discuss this example um, next week. The action of um, of RepGM on categories, which is the same thing as a Z action, essentially. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I was trying to think if if there's a if there's a really good analog of this, and I I couldn't really see it. Um, Emily, do you know if? I I don't know, but I like don't the won't the home spaces get some kind of grading from the GM action? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's one way of saying it. Is just that a a category with an action of rep GM can be de-equivariantized into a graded category. So next week I'll discuss this process of equivariantization and de-equivariantization. Um, and this is a canonical procedure by of kind of like if I have a category over point mod G, it's a canonical way of pulling back to a category over a point. And um, and doing this is um, takes a category with GM action and spits out a graded category. A category with a kind of graded home spaces or a shift of grading on, so, which is probably the analog of what you're saying. Okay, so what is going on in these examples? I just want to briefly uh, outline a, an extremely nice kind of corner of mathematics. Uh, and if you want to know more, very happy to talk about it and there's about a zillion references. So what is going on here? Or another way of um, asking this is how to predict necessary coherences. Predict um, or calculate. Uh, so the basic thing that's kind of behind all this is BG. So given G, there's the um, classifying space. BG. And the necessary coherences here come from the cells of BG. And roughly speaking, the reason that we can, um, we can have either very, uh, very holistic descriptions or very, uh, very uh, um, economical descriptions is basically the, in an in analogy to the way in which you can describe um, CW complexes either using small or large numbers of cells. And sometimes if you know a small, if you have a description using a small number of cells, certain symmetries aren't apparent and using a large um, number of cells kind of gives you a blow up of computational complexity. So in this example of G equals S1, when we had, um, sorry, when we had G equals Z, BG was S1, BG is S1, what am I doing? Okay, so we, we find BG by finding a space on which G acts freely and this space should be contractible. In the case of G equals Z, we can just take its action on the real line, in which case its quotient is S1. And this has a cell decomposition with one zero simplex. 
one zero cell, and that is M, and we have one one cell, and that is our equivalence E. Um, and in our example of G mod G equals Z mod two Z, this acts on S infinity, and this is contractible. And in this case, BG is S infinity mod Z mod two Z, which is RP infinity. And S infinity has um, a cell decomposition, a Z mod two Z equivariant cell decomposition with two one cells, two zero cells. two one cells, two two cells, etc. So we think about building up our sphere as being like this. And then we put a a cap on top and a cap on the bottom. And then we put a cap on top and the cap on the bottom of that, etc. And so this gives us so when we quotient, we get RP infinity has a cell decomposition with one zero cell, one one cell, one two cell, one three cell, etc. And this zero cell is M, the one cell is our equivalence, the two cell is our isomorphism. And the fact that this wasn't quite right um, was the fact that we actually we're missing we're missing a cell here. So the the star corresponds to this. The diagram above corresponds to that three cell. Okay. Um, and for any group G, there is the um, the Milnor construction. And this gives us um, G one cells. So one zero cell, G one cells, D times G two cells, G times G times G, three cells, etc. And so this would be our M, this would be our FG, so remember in the kind of holistic definition of a strict action, we have a one functor for every group element. And we have a mu g h for every, um, every pair of elements. And then we have a um, diagram for every three elements, et cetera. Okay. And you can ask, why does this stop at three? Uh, at three cells. And the reason is that we're acting on one categories. Okay, so if we were just acting on um, vector spaces, we would just need one endomorphism for every one cell, and then we just need a relation for every two cell. And so we could stop it. So for actions on vector spaces, we could stop at, at um, two cells. Okay, so the two cells precisely give us the relations of our, in our, in our group. Okay, so this is a really beautiful and interesting dictionary, um, which I just thought it's worth seeing. Uh, I hope that's useful. Um, if not, apologies. And uh, if you want to discuss further, 
I'm more than happy to. So now uh, comes a remark that I don't really understand. Are there any questions based on this reasonably heuristic slide? Um, so the cell decomposition for RP infinity goes on though. Mm -hmm. So should there be more data or do we also stop at three, like three? That's what I'm kind of stay, saying that for actions. So in general, we will have zero cells. Sorry. Zero cells, one cells, two cells three cells, four cells. And then we have the, so this would be the data for the, for an action on a vector space. I.e. we would like an equivalence. So we would like a, an equivalence for every group element plus a relation. When we act on a category, we go down to the three cells. I, we have our equivalents. We have some morphisms. We have some relations. And now we have relations between relations. And now if we look at an action on a two category, we would go down to Jordi, maybe there's something uh, on back of your mind that you didn't say, and that's that the action of G is supposed to be somehow related to some action of BG or something to do with BG. But what is the statement? I mean, is there I more than just the, uh, um, yeah, so. So I guess, so what, what is an action of a vector space? on a, what is it, oh, sorry. what is an action of G on a vector space? It's the same thing as a local system on BG. Yeah. So BG has a point, it's a pointed space. We look at the stalk at that point and we have a whole lot of endomorphisms of that vector space that give us the action of G. Now, one way to think about an action of G on a category as be, is as being a local system of categories on BG. So now we have our category and for each one cell we have an equivalence. Um, for each two cell we have a morphism. And then for each three cell we have some relation that those morphisms should satisfy. And in general, a, um, so I guess you could be really fancy and say that an action on an infinity category is, is a sheaf of infinity categories on BG. So I have a question about the, the slide where you define, from a group G, you defined a category where objects were RG. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go back then, to that slide if you want. And then, um, so maybe implicitly or even explicitly, uh, uh, an action of G on the category is, I guess we're, we're thinking of that the same as action of this uh, discrete groupoid on the category, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but one could have imagined a different way Namely, one could have defined from G the one-point groupoid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just one object with the morphisms being G. Mm -hmm. And then one could have looked at, you know, tried to study actions of G via actions of this one-point groupoid. And I'm just wondering... Yeah, so that one-point groupoid is BG. Yeah, exactly. So that is BG. So, um, so basically yeah, so I what... think, 
like I think that, that that's in some sense what I'm trying to get at here is that I, I think that so that's the next remark that it seems that like actually studying strict group actions on categories is not so useful in I mean there's some use to it but it's not the kind of pervasive notion in geometric representation theory and what seems to be much more pervasive is actions of rep g on monodal categories sorry action of rep g on categories and that's and that's akin to leaving out the um the loops here so just having an action of sheaves on on bg on your category which may be related to what you're asking yeah so i guess what i was saying is that it seems like then we could think of um action of g as being a functor from point mod g does that make sense yes exactly and that's and that will be the more useful notion yeah for reasons that are not entirely clear like i would love someone to explain to me uh, so i'm not sure if everyone's seen this but there's a periodic table of categories in which you kind of look at one categories two categories three categories four categories and then you look at um inside that you look at categories in which uh, all morphisms up to a particular level are the identity so for example if you do this with a category so that means so the first step of this would just be saying you have one object so this is the st statement that a category with one object is the same thing as a monoid and so there's this process of taking a higher category and imposing a certain connectedness connectedness which then takes you to a special type of so a monoid is a special type of set and similarly if you look at a two category with one object then that's equivalent to a monoidal category and i was trying to understand uh this question in this context so um maybe i'll just make the following remark um for us okay. so for whatever reason they just don't seem to show up i mean they're definitely there but they're not they don't we don't have powerful structural results for example for actions of ag for actions of this monodal category um and i just want to posit two reasons and these are speculative reason a is that we need more structure To categorify linear algebra so a simple example of this is that if we have an equivalence of a category what does it mean what is an eigenvalue And another example is in this example of um, Z acting on M, um, a technique that is extremely natural to us if we have, for example, a, an action of an equivalence of a, 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 of a vector space is to take its log. Um, so if we have an... these kind of questions and there is a theory about for example diagonalization of functors and there's a big theory of eigen objects etc but you need more structure and i don't think it's entirely clear to us what structure that is um and the second reason is that in real life examples
a break group actions. Uh, there are interesting maps from FG to FH. Okay, so the, I, I suspect that, for example, that there's a very rich theory about actions of Bray groups on categories, but you need to impose extra structure in the form of non-invertible morphisms between um, different group elements, and so that we get something that's, uh, that has more structure than just this bare object AG that we considered before. Um, and in this course, a much more important role by the actions of two, two monoidal categories, so rep H on M, so H is linear algebraic, and the other very important object will be quasi-coherent sheaves on some scheme or stack on M. Okay, so now for the rest of this lecture, I just want to give a kind of combinatorial take on, so there's a nice slogan here. Here we're studying representations of representations of H. Okay, so we're studying how does the representations of act act on a category, uh, and just um, just the tech, the kind of remark that C. F. Masood's question is that uh, this A. G. is basically sheaves on on loops on BG and rep G is sheaves on BG. And there should be a philosophical reason, which I don't know yet, um, about why it's more natural to consider actions of this one or category than this one. Okay, so now um, we'll move to SL2. So next week I'll do some general theory about uh, what it what it means for a um, monoidal category to be acted on by coherent sheaves on a um, on a scheme or stack, following this beautiful little note of Gatesbury. Uh, but now I just want to kind of, in an explicit and combinatorial way, look at the first example that is module categories for um, rep SL two. So I want to consider the category of finite dimensional representations of the Lie algebra SL2C, which is canonically equivalent to the finite dimensional representations of the algebraic group SL2C, and that's also equivalent to finite dimensional representations of SU2. And the following theorem is really beautiful. It's a little bit of a cheat because it's uh, it, the main ingredient is, um, is theorems that are not kind of proved via higher representation theory, but I still think it's a really nice example of how you can get a non-trivial classification result in higher representation theory. It's the simplest um, such example that I know. So this is a this is a monoidal category. Uh, 
and we can look at the category. So, so there's the two category of A modules. So um, M and an A module. Uh, so there's two conditions on M, which are basically semi-simplicity and smallness assumptions. So M is a category acted on by the category of representations of SL2. And the two conditions are that as a C linear category, M is semi-simple. with finitely many objects, finitely many symbols. Okay, so as a C linear category, um, M is boring. It's equivalent to a number of copies of vector spaces. And the second assumption is that there exists some object. This is like an indecomposability assumption. So there exists a, a module M in M such that if I act on M with SL2, and take all uh, sum ands, sums. So this is Zergel's notation for Caribbean envelope, and I really love it. It's a direct minus, as opposed to a direct sum. such that this is the whole category. And this, the theorem is that this is the same thing as, um, as simply laced Dinkin diagrams. So module categories for A for representations of SL2 are classified in a very simple way. So perhaps you can already see the punchline. Um, so sketch of proof. So first I want to construct the um, arrow in this direction. And to do this, we recall that finite subgroups of SL2 are in bijection with simply laced Dinkin diagrams. So I can replace uh, this side with uh, finite subgroups. And so it's enough to, given a finite subgroup, construct an M. And we do this in a very simple way, namely restriction from um, SL2 to gamma. So probably you know by now that I have this eternal problem that I never know whether to write restriction above or below. Um, and I've now totally given up. From, so we can consider the restriction functor to this subgroup, and this gives us a monoidal functor. You know, restriction is a tensor functor. Is 
Das ist eine Tensorfunktion. Yeah. And so, if we set m to be rep by that dimensional c gamma, this gives us a, an a module. This is, I'm just kind of using the categorical analog of the statement that if I have an algebra homomorphism from A to B, then B is an A module. This gives an, this gives an A module satisfying our conditions. Okay. Why does it satisfy our assumptions? So, this is a finite group, so its category of representations is semi-simple. So this is a semi-simple abelian category with finitely many simples. And the natural representation is, uh, is faithful. And so that means that um, this category is generated. If I take, for example, the trivial representation and act on it by the tensor powers of the natural representation, I will get all simple modules of some ends. So remember that any faithful module tensor generates okay. So that's our arrow in that direction. So now to go back the other way is much more complicated. And I'll only um, outline this. Are there any questions based on this? So Jordi, this condition two in the theorem, mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm misreading it, but it looks more like something is cyclic than in the mm. So yeah, probably that's a better way of saying it. Yeah, so it's Yeah, so it's cyclically generated by a simple. Um which is kind of somewhere halfway between the two. Because this means that the fact that I'm asking, oh, sorry, I should have said that this is simple. So this is literally cyclic, but there exists a simple M. So if you think in the decategorified de language, I'm restricting the number of the, the, I'm restricting the vectors that I'm allowing to be cyclic generators. So, as a corollary, we, we get that there is a, I'm just trying to understand, so we get that there is a two category whose K, whose growth in the group is given by simply less thinking diagram. There's this two category of representations of rep SL2. Yeah, I, I just don't think that it's very, I don't think that there's very, like, th for example, I suspect that there's no homes between the different Maybe that's incorrect. Yeah, it's a good question. What is this? So I've just set up to equivalence, but yeah. Yeah, good question. I would have said that there's no homs, but now I'm suspicious about that. That seems wrong. Okay, nice question. So uh, just to kind of digest this a little bit. So what we've seen here is that basically module categories are the same thing as finite subgroups. And so in quantum algebra, often one thinks about module categories for some tensor category as being something like subgroups. And that's a very useful point of view. 
some, something like subgroups with source. Uh, okay, I'm going on and unless there's other questions. So going, This way is harder. And I just want to outline, um, firstly, how to kind of think about this in one way. So we take, the, there's an elementary approach. Which is elementary. And then there's another approach um, in the kind of stack language that I'll just, that I may or may not discuss next week that's less elementary but perhaps a little bit more conceptually enlightening as to what's going on um, so basically we we kind of go back via generators and relations so um, i just want to recall briefly so every um, irreducible representation of every irreducible in our tensor category a remember a is the rep finite dimensional of SL2, every irreducible A module is a sum end inside V tensor N, where V is the natural representation of SL2. Okay, again, because this is a faithful module. Um, And so what this tells us is that A is tensor generated by, by the natural. So this monodal category is generated by one object. So And what this tells us, so this is a very common theme in, um, in our part of geometric representation theory, that all of these operations here are basically formal once you know the endomorphism algebra of tensor powers of V. So the second statement is that the endomorphisms of the tensor powers of V is the tempered lieb algebra. And this tells us that A admits a presentation with one generator um, two morphisms two generating morphisms so this is a map from V so the two maps, so this is the cut map and the cap map. Sorry, the cap map and the cut map. And relations two. So this is the, the dimension of V is this is encoding the fact that the dimension of V is two. So this is the um, trace and identity map. If we identify, so V is canonically isomorphic to V dual. So this is V tensor V is canonically isomorphic to the endomorphisms of V. And on that we have the trace and the inclusion of the identity, the inclusion of the trivial module. And yeah, so trace of identity is a dimension which gives us this relation and then we have that v is by a joint so which encodes the fact that v is by a joint now given so probably 
the way that we would start off this from a kind of elementary approach is that we would first observe that we have these module categories associated to um, subgroups and then try to see that this is it. And we might do so by building a graph. So this is a classical graph in the Mackay correspondence. So the vertices correspond to the simple simple, object, simple objects in M up to isomorphism. And we have an edge from a simple M to M. Um, so, I mean, for a priori, we have an edge like this, if and only if um, M prime occurs when we act by this natural module on M, it occurs inside here as a sum end, but by by a jointness, So this is the statement that this home space is non-zero, but by a, jo by a jointness, we can move V across the other side. And we see that this is, the sa this is the same thing as M occurring in V tensor M prime. So this implies that the graph is not directed. Okay, so I can just uh, draw a simple edge here. And so so the bijointness tells us that this graph is symmetric. And the the condition that this equals 2 um does something to the eigenvalues of m. Oh sorry, does something now we do some algebra with the um, plus the adjacency ma matrix of this graph. to conclude that this graph is either an ADE affine Dinkin diagram or a tadpole. which looks like this. And then you um, work harder and rule out tadpole. And then argue moreover that this graph already determines, determines M up to equivalence and uh, and so your putative list of module categories is ex in fact exhaustive. Okay, so that's the sketch of this argument. Um, so I guess this 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 argument is just meant to meant to show you. I guess the most important bit here is just this idea of um, there's these kind of two worlds. There's the generators and relations world in which we do things like these kind of arguments. 
And then there's the more holistic world, um, which I'll explore next time. And it's very useful to have both in mind. So in this kind of elementary approach and action of a monoidal category is a rather kind of explicit thing. We just have a certain number of endofunctors, a certain number of morphisms between those endofunctors and a certain number of relations. And then we try to deduce structure results. And then there's um, the holistic approach that we'll see next time. And then I guess by the end of next week, we will return to, um, to Archipod Pesro Kavnikov. And as usual,